When it comes to improving the value on a property, one of the best ways to do that is to increase the volume. But that generally means you'll probably need planning permission or maybe using permitted development rights. But there's so much confusion between the two. In this video, I want to break down exactly what they are, how they work, so you can pick the right one for you. If you're watching my videos for the first time, my name is Saj Hussain. On this channel, I share with you my 15 years of property investing experience to ultimately help you get further faster in your own property investing journey. When it comes to getting permission on being able to convert or change a property, improve it, change its use, increase the volume, you know, any of these type of changes you wanna use, it means somebody's gonna to have to make a decision whether we can do that. And that's generally planning permission we're talking about, or sometimes it may be possible to do it under what's called permitted development rights. But how do you work out which is the right one and what you can and can't do, and why are they so restrictive anyway? Well, when we look at our country here, when we look at on a map, you'll see the vast majority is not built on. People talk about there's a shortage of accommodation, there's not enough homes, we're not building enough, and there's this huge amount of green land when you look at a map and that exists because there's some controls and measures in place in terms of what we can build how we can build and what can be built in terms of the type of building as well and these are all based around laws that were put in place in 1948 called the town and planning act 1948 these are essentially government guidelines that give us certain um, guidance in what we can build and where we can build it so for instance you know let's say you've got a huge garden and you think well i'd love to build a 20-story tower block here because i think it'd be a great development so there's things in place that will prevent you from doing that. And if you're thinking right now, well, I should have the freedom to build whatever I want. Well, just think if the shoe was on the other foot and your neighbor had a huge garden and they decided they wanted to build a 20 story tower block, you'd probably not be too keen. So it's really about trying to get some balances in place. So what's the difference between planning permission and permitted development? Well, planning permission is based on the Town and Planning Act 1948, which is a set of guidelines that the national government put down in terms of what we can build, how we should build those things, and really a set of rules for us to be able to follow. Permitted development, on the other hand, is a set of guidance that's been applied to each property and what we can do without necessarily going to have to get some permissions. And that's based on the general permitted development order. So two sets of acts, if you like, in terms of what rules and guidelines apply to the two. The easiest way to think about it, and the way I like to try and remember it, is planning permission is when you need to go and ask for permission. And permitted development is when you tell planning, this is what I'm going to do. So again, they need to fit within certain guidelines, but essentially that's really the difference between the two. In terms of why we have these things in place is really just to have some kind of order in terms of how things are built, what's built, and some kind of control in terms of the volume of building as well. When you look at some places like this, for instance, things can look quite chaotic. It doesn't mean they don't have any rules or guidelines in place. It just means where maybe things are a little bit more relaxed. There's no real consistency in terms of style or things or what's being built. Now, over the years, these things do change as well. So you look around some towns and cities and there's a massive contrast in terms of type of buildings and that be built at different times. And that's just as things evolve and policies evolve as well. But what it means is that there are some controls and measures in place. Now, by understanding the difference between planning and permitted development rights and how it works, what it means is that you can really benefit from it and make use of it in terms of turn it to your advantage, whether you're a homeowner, whether you're a property developer. Now, as a property developer, we're always looking to try and increase value on a building by building it out and making it more modern, ultimately to be able to turn a profit on that. But one of the biggest restrictions and challenges for us is being able to change the way the property to the way we want to, from what it is to what we want to take it to. And that's where we're restricted by planning and permitted, uh, uh, permitted development rights, for example. But by understanding them and applying them in the right way, you can really benefit from that and maybe be able to see beyond a project that other people may not necessarily be able to see because they don't really understand how this works. Now, the key thing with planning and permitted development rights is being able to get this right from the offset right at the beginning before you start a project. So that means before you start any building work, you want to make sure you understand what you can do, how you can do that, make sure you've got the relevant approvals in place. And I know there's things like retrospective planning when you can apply for planning after you've built something, but hey, that's never really the best way to approach these type of projects. Before we talk about permitted development rights and how they work, I want to focus on planning permission, the process and exactly how that works. But just before we do any of those things, a quick caveat to say, look, what I'm sharing with you is my knowledge and experience. I'm not an expert when it comes to planning. I'm not an architect either or a planning consultant. It's really important you're enlisting the expertise of the right people on your project because there's so many variations and little things you need to be aware of when it comes to planning and permitted development. 
Now, when I'm looking for an expert to help us with some of the projects that we work on, I'm more interested in their experience rather than the letters and the qualifications they have. That's just my personal view. I really look for the right experience so that people can add the most value to the type of projects that we're doing. Let's now jump into planning permission. So you've had massive inspiration about a project that you want to do. You've enlisted the help of an expert like an architect or maybe an architect or technician who's gonna draw out the plans for you and make that vision come to life. So what's the process that we need to follow? Well, once we've got all those drawings ready, what we need to do is get that planning application submitted to the local authority. And when you submit that application, one of the first things that happens is that it needs to be validated. And what that means is it needs to be acceptable in its form for it to move forward to the next stage. And often on the council website, you'll be able to see a validation list in terms of the things they require for an application to be valid. So for example, it could be something as simple as a fee needs to be paid at that time of submission for it to be accepted, or it could be there's certain types of reports that need to be submitted if it's something a little bit more complex in terms of that particular planning application. But essentially you submit the planning application, it then goes through a validation process as long as it's validated, then the clock starts to tick. So the next 21 days are called the consultation period. This is where people that might have an interest in that particular planning application are then invited for some feedback as well. Let's say, for example, I'm going to take a house, I'm going to turn it into a seven bedroom HMO and I make a planning application for Sui Generous to run as a seven person HMO. So you might have, for example, local police uh, there, you might have uh, local community members there that are active that all have an interest in what's going to happen to that particular property and of course, as well as the neighbors on that property as well. So they all may want to have an input in terms of what their views are on that particular application. Now, some of them may be there, just their opinions in terms of what they think. Other times they could have valid objections. So for example, if you're gonna build a wall against somebody's window and block out their light, that could be fairly valid in terms of that's something they're not gonna be very happy about and it affects them uh, directly as well. The next stage is when the person that's been allocated to your particular application, the case officer, they review the application and then what's known as the determination period where they're looking at it and considering it. Now during this time, they might also pop out or maybe even before this, they might pop out to do a site visit to have a look at what it is that's actually going on, what they're trying to build, just to get a bit more of a sense check. And I know Google Maps has made a big difference in terms of site visits. Not everything needs necessarily a visit required, but sometimes they might come out and have a look at the, uh, uh, have a look at the site. Now during this time where they're determining it, it's really important, and I learned this the hard way, it's really important that you get some kind of dialogue going because some of my early planning applications, I would send them in, keep your fingers crossed, keep your legs crossed and just hope for the best and just pray that you're gonna get a positive result. It doesn't quite work that way. It might turn out in your favor, it may not. But during this stage, it's really important you get a dialogue going because you can start talking to the case office in terms of what their view is, what their kind of gut feeling is, does it look like they're giving you kind of positive vibes or does it sound like they're not very happy in what they see? In which case now during this time, you can kind of work with them, negotiate a little bit with them to try and find a solution that might work. So for example, if they've got certain concerns um, uh, about the number of people, for example, can be living there in a HMO, it may be that you're gonna make some suggestions to make some changes. So rather than just letting them make a decision on what you've already submitted, you can work with them, provide them additional information, do clarification um, for them if required as well, um, consider particular objections that might have come up and how you can deal with those. So this way you're increasing the chances of being able to get what you want. And I know sometimes that we've experienced this as well, we submit an application and then you try and liaise with the, uh, the person, the case officer that's dealing with it and it's just really difficult to get hold of them. And of course, over the last year, year and a half, particularly with the pandemic, it means a lot of them are working from home. They are massively under-resourced. They're trying to do a lot of things and they're really struggling to get all those things done. I remember speaking to a friend a couple of years ago and they were telling me about this planning application that they'd prepared and they'd sent it to the planning officer and they were having a negotiation with them and been constant dialogue in terms of what's happening with the application. And they were just so excited. And I was thinking, do you really think the planning officer is probably gonna be losing sleep overnight because your planning application? The reality is they've got this huge number of applications to deal with and they're not spending a massive amount of time on them. They're gonna whiz through it quite quickly. So it's really important that you've got all the information ready that you can send them to really be able to build a strong case to be able to get an approval. Because remember, to some extent, planning permission is subjective. Now, if you've got something that's a little bit more complex, it might go to what's called committee. A committee is essentially that, a group of people that sit together and have a look at your application. But the challenge with committees, in my personal experience, is often the people in that committee have no real experience of planning or building or even some kind of commercial awareness sometimes as well. 
And although the planning officer is there and there to guide them, but really this is where it starts becoming very subjective in terms of their views and their opinions, as opposed to really what the proper rules are in terms of what you can and can't build. So what that can mean sometimes when it comes to your decision, your decision might get declined, for instance, if you get a no, at that point you can either resubmit your application again, or if you may go to appeal, which is really um, uh, another process that you can challenge the previous decision. And sometimes if you think it hasn't followed the correct process, you can do that. Now, the biggest issue with that is the time involved and also the cost, because if let's say as a property developer, you're running a project, you've got bridging costs, you can't afford to sit around six, eight months a year for something to go through appeal. So it can put massive pressure on you if you don't get that uh, planning application through. Generally speaking, you should be getting a response to your planning application in about eight weeks. Doesn't mean it's always gonna be in that time. Sometimes it can ask for an extension in terms of the time to be able to determine it because they need some more time to review it. But it's usually about two months, eight weeks to be able to get a decision. Now let's say you get that decision. It's a positive decision, fantastic. Often what that will mean is you get a piece of paper that says, yes, you can build X, Y, Z based on these drawings, what you've, you've asked for, but it may come with some conditions as well. And conditions are something to be aware of because there's different types of conditions. Sometimes it could be pre-commencement conditions. That means before you actually start work, you need to satisfy certain things. Um, other times it could be preoccupation. Um, what that means is before somebody actually lives in the property, certain things need to be done uh, as well. This is usually on bigger developments that you will get this as opposed to say a little extension that you might have on your, uh, on your home. Uh, sometimes it could be reports that are required as well that need satisfying. So there's a number of things that may come with the planning approval as a set of conditions that you need to be aware of. And those conditions could be you know, a short paragraph or it could be several pages long in terms of those particular requirements. Hey, if you're enjoying this content, it would really help me out if you could just click on that like button just below here. It just means that YouTube will then share this with many more people just like you so that they can also benefit as well. And if you're enjoying the content, of course, you want to subscribe to the channel so that you can see more great content just like this. Now, just before we talk about permitted development, make sure you watch all the way to the end because I'm going to share with you my three ninja tactics when it comes to these type of applications that many people don't talk about. We've been talking about you getting planning approval for that particular property, but actually, technically speaking, it's not you that gets the approval. That approval is attached to the property that you make the application for. So for instance, let's say you're doing something creative like an option agreement on somebody else's property where you're going to get planning gain, you want to, to get planning permission to do something, improve its value so that you can sell that property on because it's going to be worth significantly more. You need to make sure you've got the right paperwork in place to protect you because it's not you that will get the approval, the approval will be attached to that particular building. So whoever has control or ownership of the building is the one that's going to be able to benefit from it. And of course, it's uh, you know you see it uh, quite a lot where approvals are granted, planning approvals, but it doesn't doesn't necessarily mean somebody builds it out, it could be the change of mind or circumstances are now different. Whatever it might be, not all planning permissions actually turn into actual buildings that have been improved or changed as well. Now this is where permitted development rights can be considered where you can do certain changes on a building because a property comes with certain rights already, there's certain things you can do because remember it's the building we're talking about rather than what you can um, do, what rights that building has in terms of how it can be modified and changed. Um, without going through a full planning process. And many people think about, uh, when it talks about permitted development, people talk about extensions, uh, rare extensions, or a loft conversion. These are the most common things people associate with permitted developments. But there's lots of different types of permitted development. So for instance, one of the ones we used to use quite a lot was where we take a family house and turn it into a six-person HMO, effectively what's called a C3 use, change into a C4 use. And what that means is that we can turn a house into a HMO without requiring any planning permission. However, also, just as with planning permission, there's lots of variations and things you need to think about. It's not just an assumption that, yes, you can apply these things and it just will work because there could be certain changes or caveats. For example, what applies to houses is different to flats, for instance. In conservation areas, it can make a difference as well. Listed buildings, all these things will have an impact. And of course, the local authority have the ability to be able to remove certain PD rights as well, permitted development rights, um, under what's called Article 4 direction. They usually go through a one year consultation and then they remove these rights if it's something they want to do. And this is something they've done recently in Birmingham where they've removed the ability to be able to take a family house and turn it into a HMO, which was previously permitted development. So that means now if you want to do that, you have to go through the full planning application process, which is what we were talking about earlier on. This is why it's really useful by understanding how these things work and you can use them in the right order to get things done. 
So for instance, one of the things we would do, we would take a family house and make the relevant extensions, for example, a ray extension or a loft conversion on that as a family house, because that can be done as a family house under permitted development. We would then turn it into a six bedroom, uh, six person HMO, again, under permitted development without going through any planning approval to be able to do this. And then once that's been established up and running, we would then maybe change it from a six person to a seven person HMO, which moves into another category called sui generis, which requires planning permission. But now our planning application is to change a six person HMO to a seven person, which of course is gonna get less resistance than going in and starting to make an application right from the offset that has an extension, a loft conversion, a family house being turned into a seven person HMO. Of course, you have all the neighbors up in arms and get everybody turning against you. By doing it in these little stages, what it means is that you can take advantage of what's available to you just by understanding how these things work. If you're interested in HMOs and planning permission, then make sure you watch this video, which will link up here, which is a video I've done before on that topic in much more detail. When it comes to permitted development rights, there's also a lot of misunderstanding around what it is you can and can't actually do. So often people talk about, oh, we can put a, a three meter extension on the back of a, a house um, under permitted development, but you can't do anything more than that. Well, actually you could have an eight meter extension on a detached family house under permitted development, that's huge. And if you're able to do that, and by understanding the process, it's slightly different from a normal permitted development because there's other factors taken into consideration. For example, a thing called neighbor notification. What that means is as long as your neighbors don't object, they'll be okay with that. But if your neighbors do object, then they might restrict it and it might pull back to say three meters. But again, just by understanding how these things work is how you can really take advantage of it. This is where you need good people around you to make sure you can make the best of your project that you're working on. Another great misunderstanding is sometimes people will look at a particular building and they say, hey, I wanna do this with this particular house because that neighboring one over there, they've done something similar as well. That means I could probably do it as well. Surely if they've done it, I should be able to do the same. But we need to take into account that policies will change over time. So what was allowed, for example, when they built that may not be the case now. What you might be able to do in the future is not what's now. So right now, planning is going through a lot of changes. It means in a few years time, we'll be able to do things that we can't do right now, uh, for example, under uh, PD. So it's understanding that policy is constantly evolving and changing and the people in the planning uh, teams that lead these teams, they'll have a certain vision of what they want to see happen in the towns and cities. So if I just look around Birmingham, for example, and I look at some of the buildings that were constructed in the 60s and 70s, and you think, what on earth were they thinking when they gave approval to that? What were they smoking at that time? Because it's crazy, some of these buildings, you think, you know, they just don't fit in and you think, why is it that they approve those? Well, because planning changes, it evolves, as I said, and right, what they're thinking right now may be very different in a few years time, and it's probably very different to what it was a few years ago. The reality is when we talk about planning and approvals and permitted development, this is really an area of law, a specialist area of law. And architects who we rely on, no disrespect to them, they're not lawyers, they're not experts in law, they're expertise in creativity and design and property and what you can build uh, in terms of what you can build on paper or on screen, but when you need to get approval to actually build it, that's the process we're talking about right now. This is why I think it's important to get maybe a planning consultant or somebody that's got the relevant experience behind them particularly with things that are a little bit more complex to be able to get them through the planning process for you. And planning, again, as we were talking about earlier on, is really a set of guidelines rather than a set of black and white rules. And what that means is planning officers, it it's, can be very subjective, their opinion in terms of what they think should be done or shouldn't be done. Just because you think this is a, a, a nice looking uh, project, it doesn't mean they're gonna think it looks like a nice looking project as well. If you're a fan of some of the TV programs like Grand Designs and other similar programs where you've got this architect comes in and comes up with this amazing scheme and think, oh, this looks fantastic. And then they get it in through planning and then planning don't agree necessarily and it gets knocked back and changed. And what they end up building is very different because the vision of what the architect had isn't necessarily how the planners will see it as well. As a reward for watching this far, I'm gonna now share with you my three ninja tactics that many people don't talk about. The first one is actually thinking tactfully. What we mean by that is by understanding how you can do things in stages rather than just going all in, laying all your cards on the table in terms of what you want to do. And the example I gave earlier on is like we take a family house, do all the extensions and the permitted development first, then turn it into a six person HMO, then turn it into a seven person sui generis HMO. But doing it in stages, we mean we're much more confident we're gonna get what we want rather than just going in all guns blazing right from the offset. So thinking tactfully, 
tactfully is the first one. The second one is by having multiple applications. So you can actually submit more than one application at the same time for a particular building. Now it's not necessarily uh, something you want to do every single time, but sometimes you can have multiple applications in and sometimes we will do this with a PD and a planning application as well. So what we're saying is, hey, look, this is what we want to do under, P, uh, under uh, a planning application. We think it's going to look fantastic, you know, and uh, we can also do this one under PD, which maybe looks a little bit ugly, but we don't need your permission to do it. We can build it anyway. And of course, what it just means is you've got a little bit more negotiation. It may be that you only want one anyway, but this is another tactic that sometimes we'll use by having more than one application in at the same time. The third tip is when you're negotiating with the planners, when you're talking to them during that phase where they're doing the determination, and if it looks like it's not really heading in your favor and it's very likely this application is gonna get refused, my preference will be to pull that application back and withdraw it rather than having a mark against it, again, that it's been refused, planning permission. Now, so what that means is we can then modify and go back in again and make a new application and we haven't got all the baggage of the previous one already there. And of course, another way to look at this, if you do get it refused, then you can effectively end up with what my friend calls a shopping list of things to fix. So that means if you make another application again, then you just need to be able to fix those particular things that it was refused on. Because after refusing on specific things, they can't just turn around and say, hey, we don't like it, so here's a refusal. It doesn't quite work that way. And I remember a story that uh, um, I heard from somebody who had submitted an application about eight times and every time they got refused. And I think, why would you do that? They'd submitted the same application each time and it meant every time they get refused on the same thing. And of course, that's not really gonna change unless there's some change in policy or something. You're gonna get a refusal every single time. Planning gain is one of my most favorite ways to increase the value on a particular property. The reality is it's a paper exercise. That means you don't even have to pick up a brick to significantly increase the value of a property, just using the things that we were talking about earlier on. Now, what I've got lined up over here next for you is a video that YouTube tells me that you're really gonna enjoy. But just before you do that, if you haven't already, make sure you click on my face down here to subscribe to the channel. And I look forward to seeing you on this video just over here.